<laughs> it's so fun, huh? So um, I got I to gotta, I gotta share with you something before this, and Annette's probably going to... Yeah. We'll get to... We'll, 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 we'll get to that, but, but I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what's happening to Annette here in this last few months, but yesterday, you know, we were doing some landscaping, and she painted a door, and I was power wide. We did all kinds of stuff. Went for a nice bike ride. Uh, we had a great day, and uh, we, we, were gonna, we were cooking dinner last night. I brought the grill to the back, and we're doing grilling. We ate out on the patio. It was just awesome. And then she gets up and she walks around the, the back side of the house and I can hear her back there, oh, this would be a great spot for a hammock, <laughs> which is fine. But then she comes back and she says, we could get chickens. <laughs> True story, just last night. And I'm like, chickens? You're coming from, from downtown Minneapolis to chickens? <laughs> so I just thought it was funny. I just thought it was funny. Anyway, and that's not in my notes, but it just dawned on me this morning that that would be a funny opener, wouldn't it? Chickens! Yeah, I just can't imagine Annette chasing a chicken. I, I mean, just get, in her high heels. Can you imagine that? Although I have a picture of her digging a, a, some dirt with, I should have put that up, digging some dirt with with shorts on and, uh, you know, those hunter boots, hunter, I don't know what they're called, the rain boots or whatever, up to here in short, <laughs> hysterical. I mean, it's like, boy, she's moving right in, isn't she? First the boots, now chickens. <laughs> anyway, this is some fun stuff. Hey, you know what? Um, since, since, since I've been here, you've heard me say many times that, that I am or that... Um, that we are transparent, you know, we are who we are and we don't put on a different hat when we're at home or here with you in private, in public, out in the city. We are who we are. And in part of that transparency, um, I, t- to me, I like to be 100% real. So today I'm going to share with you a struggle that I'm, I'm kind of having um, lately, especially in the last maybe month, okay? So it's just a struggle that, that I'm working through, and a lot of you guys are going to be able to relate to that. But um, as, as most of you are aware, um, and I know everybody here knows, uh, in addition to work to pastoring this church, I work a, a full-time job. And I should say, hey, online, okay? We know you're there. I know you're there. Okay, so, so I just had to make that an <laughs> announcement. So anyway, um, um, but, but in, in my job, sometimes, sometimes the work coming in is, is very, very manageable. You know, it's, it's fine. It comes in. We process it. I do what I have to do, and, and we get it sent out. But sometimes um, there is just... It's absolutely insane. I mean, insane. Uh, everything we do is basically email, and, and it's like ping, 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 and I'm like, another bid request, and uh, another bid invitation, another, and she's going and going, and that's like, I can't keep up. What's going on here? And she's trying to process through everything for me. It just gets insane, and I never know each day as it goes past what I'm in store for. It's a day-by-day Thing. And I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know how much, but every day I'm dealing with this, just, well, I should say we're dealing with this um, constant barrage of stuff. And, and it's really hard to plan, okay? And if you know me for a minute, <laughs> you know that I'm a planner. I like to have some sort of, some sort of, of direction with um, um, I'm going in, fill the finish this box and move on to the next, move on to the next. But, but this you just, you just can't do. And it seems like I live my life because I can't schedule anything in this revolving door and I'm just waiting for the moment where I can jump out. But I just keep spinning around and around in this. It, it's, just, it's just the way it is. So, so that's a frustration. But what's even more frustration, and I apologize to anybody that's in architecture, but architects 
don't do their jobs these days. They just don't. I don't know what to say. They don't. Um, They leave all the details out and they leave it up for interpretation. It's just just the way, it wasn't like this years ago. They did a decent job. Now, no, no. Everything is, is, is left out. And it's frustrating because it takes three times the amount of time, at least three times the amount of time to do something because, because all the work that you, you, you spend on this initially is wasted because once they specify the details, you have to do it all over again. And it's just really, really frustrating because to me it's just this giant waste of time. Why don't you send it out when we have the details, and I'll, we'll give you some decent numbers because everything then, every time it comes back to everybody, they add to it. Only because they're frustrated, and I'm not the only one that does it. I talk to many. So, so it's just super frustrated. And, and I get into the office some days, and, and it, it's just like, I, I, don't even, I don't even know where to start. It's like, I just have all this stuff and I'm just look, looking, I'm like, oh man. And then, and, and it's always at that point that my brain then, it shifts, into, it shifts into another gear, it shifts into the overdrive, and I'm thinking, oh, I got all this work in front of me here, and then it shifts to everything I have to do at the church. Everything else going on in my life. When am I going to have time to write my message this week? When, when am I going to have time to make those phone calls and send out those emails that I have to send out? When am I going to find the time to do this? When, when am I going to have the time to whatever it is, fill in blank? I just, I'm just like, wow. And I just feel sometimes lately so overwhelmed with everything that I have to do and everything that I have to accomplish that I just, I'm just exhausted from feeling overwhelmed and I don't even, haven't even done anything yet. Do you know what I'm saying? You just get exhausted. And, and I, think, I think sometimes, oh man, if there was only one more day in the week, if we had an eight-day week, if we had 417 days in the year, it would be so much easier. Even one more hour a day would be so much easier. Can anybody relate? Can anybody relate to that? Just a little bit more time. And there's many times um, things in our lives that can, can make us feel overwhelmed, isn't there? I mean, there's just so much stuff. I mean, if you're like me, my, it's just like I have so much to do. I have so much to do. And, and, and nothing, oh man, I'm just never going to finish on time. There's just, I'm just never going to finish on time. We need more time. You know, there's, there's people feel overwhelmed when they're thinking, I just don't have enough money to make my payments this month. You're overwhelmed with that. Or, or you know, or may, maybe your family's a mess and, you, and you're having relationship issues with your family. And, and then there's just the, the daily thing or the weekly thing, like who's going to pick up the kids from practice? We're, we're all so busy. And that list of what can overwhelm us goes on and on and on, and it just seems like it's never ending. But, but life just seems so overwhelming sometimes, doesn't it? But, but you know what it's caused by most? It's caused by worry. Most of being overwhelmed is caused by actually worrying. And, 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 and it seems like the whole world right now that we live in is just obsessed isn't it? Obsessed with being worried. Worried? We've become this whole world of a bunch of worriers and we're worried about anything and we're worried about everything. We're just worried. And when, you know, we worry, we worry about our kids, right? We worry about our kids. And, and even, even as adult kids, we, we worry, sometimes we worry about our adult children more than we worried about our kids when they were in the house, right? And then the opposite happens. When you're a child, you start worrying about your elderly parents, right? It goes in reverse of that. Uh, uh, we, we worry about our finances. Am I going to have enough for retirement? We worry about, we worry about how, how we look or what others think of us. How does my hair look today? I, I got to get to the hairdresser. You know, I mean, we worry about these things. We worry about health issues. And some of these health issues that we're experiencing are actually brought on by being worried. 
Huh? I mean, I mean, and, and, and then we catch this disease, and this is the disease I made up. Overwhelmed arthritis. <laughs> right? Overwhelmed arthritis. And why did I call it that? Because being overwhelmed can cripple us. So we laugh, but think about it. It makes sense. Being overwhelmed can just... But why? I mean, we, we, just, we, just, we just worry so much. It's just unbelievable. And, and, when, and when we get this worry and we get overwhelmed, we start to, to, to suffer some things, don't we? We, we can suffer, we suffer from, from um, depression. We can suffer from uh, sleep loss. I just, I just got all this stuff on my mind. I'm so worried. I'm so overwhelmed. I can't even sleep. I, I, know, I know we've all experienced it. Anxiety. Oh. We get anxious just because we have so much to do. How am I going to do this? And that list can go on and on and on just as well, right? But, but, but why do we worry? Why do we? And, and is it worth it? Is it worth it worrying? I mean, think about it. In 2019, not all that long ago, a study was done by Penn State University, and it was actually published then in Psychology Today. Okay, so, so that, that was my reference on it, but they found in this study that, that 91% of what we worry, 91% of what we worry about doesn't come true. It doesn't come true. And, and one in four people of, in that study, 25% of the people, zero came true. 100% never happened in that study. And think about this. This is a world study. This is at Penn State and psychology. This is a world study. So, so we as believers, with our hope in Christ, we have no reason at, our, at all to suffer from the overwhelmed arthritis, Do we? We have no reason at all. So, so we can conclude that, that what we worry about really, I mean, is actually just, just our own mind, a fearful mind, and we're allowing the enemy to come in and penetrate this mind, right? To punish us with all this embellishment, all this exaggeration, and all this shit. That's what we can conclude from this, but unfortunately, us as believers... In our fearful mind, we just can't seem to escape the thought of worrying. And that worry to the point of being overwhelmed. We just, we just can't escape that even as believers. And then I thought, and then I thought, I wonder, I wonder if a study would, was done about uh, are you worried about not being worried would you worry about not worrying? <laughs> Think about that. It's just a thought in my mind, my, my, my odd thought process in my mind. But most of us, I'm sure, have reached a point in our lives where, we, where we've pretty much hit our limit, right? We've just hit our limit, and we finally say, you know, I need some help. I need some help. We've just, we've just gotten to the point where just, we're just simply too overwhelmed and I need some help. I mean, there's some encouragement though. You know why there's encouragement? You know who else was overwhelmed? Jesus. Jesus was overwhelmed. I mean, just imagine, just imagine for a second how overwhelming it must have been to know that, that the misery that you were going to be facing. Imagine that. You knew it. Just imagine knowing the physical pain that was just inevitable. Right? Think of going to the dentist <laughs> and getting that old shot in your mouth. I mean, imagine a thousand, thousand times worse than that, knowing you were going to be suffering that. Just imagine. But see, God, he can turn all these horrible situations or all these horrible circumstances into a miracle because, because our Father controls everything. He controls everything. 
And, and he's even con- in control of it when we can't see it. He can still control it. He's still in control. Even when everything around us, everything around us seems to be spinning out of control in our minds, God is still in control. God is still in control. See, Jesus, Jesus can relate to us. He can relate to us because even though he was God, he was still fully human. And, and, and he experienced the same experience as we experience. He did, he did and had the same opportunity to do what we can do. There's no difference. He, under his extreme stress, under his pressure, feeling overwhelmed by what was inevitable, he experiences what we experience. Let's look at his experience in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? And, and, and how he handled his worry. Let's, let's look at that in Matthew. Now I'm going to read this first portion here, and, and it's... it's I kept it in here, it's a b- bunch of scripture, but I kept it in here just to remind us because I think we do need a constant reminder of, of the suffering of Christ for us or what it would have been like just prior to him um, when he was with his, his disciples up in the room, okay? So as we'll start in verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to it for God. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And we know how all that happened. Okay, and Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Now, I just read that as just a nice reminder of us, okay, because we cannot hear that story enough, I think. We cannot hear that portion of this this, this, story. uh, experience enough okay so so then picking up in verse 36 then jesus went with them to the olive grove called Geth- Gethsem- gethsemane i need a drink of water if i say that again and he said sit here while i go over there to pray sit here while i go over there to pray he took peter and zebedee's two sons james and john and he became anguished and distressed He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, could you watch with me for?" Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and he prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they could not keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Because of Jesus' humanness, 
when he was on this same planet, this planet Earth, he encountered the exact same temptations. He encountered the same trials. He encountered everything else. All the junk that we encounter, he encountered because he was fully human. Here's, here's a reminder of what, what Paul says in Hebrews. He says, this high priest, meaning Jesus, of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There, will be, there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. He endured stress, sorrow, and being overwhelmed, just like we do. Just like we do. The NIV says, my, in verse 38 of it, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Jesus was overwhelmed. Jesus' heart was overwhelmed. And I'm sure, I'm sure that most of us here can identify with that emotion, can't we? Can't we? I think if you, if you say no, I think you're lying. I know I can't. I, I, and I'm certain all of us this, in here this morning to have felt completely overwhelmed at some point in our lives. Can I see that with a show of hands? Yeah, yeah. We're overwhelmed. But isn't it encouraging, just as we read in this scripture, that Jesus had the same feelings, that Jesus experienced the same feelings, that same emotion that we have. And I think it's encouraging so we can know, so we can know that just because we show a sign of weakness, just because we're struggling, just because we can't get over something and we're feeling over, it isn't failure. You know why it isn't failure? Because Jesus was perfect and he reached the point of feeling overwhelmed. Isn't that encouraging to know? And guess what got him through this situation? Prayer. Prayer got him through this situation. He prayed to his father. He prayed to the father. He prayed to our father. That's who he prayed to. And that is exactly, and I know, and I know how cliche it may sound time after time and time after time again. But that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. We need to pray when we get this feeling of being so overwhelmed. Because we're not alone. Jesus knows exactly what we're feeling. He knows exactly. Paul wrote, wrote, right, in Philippians, he said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. What did he say? Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Let's say it a different way. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. But pray about everything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Pray! Pray, people, pray. NIV in verse 6 says, Don't, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So let me ask you this question. When you're overwhelmed, how much time do you spend in prayer? cry out to God or do you cry out to the situation you're in? I know what I do probably most times. Try to figure it out on my own. But now, but now, I just read the scripture from Paul, right? If you, if you want to keep worry out of your mind, pray. Pray about everything. Pray about anything. Pray, 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 pray. The key to overcoming this anxiety and this world so we don't become overwhelmed 
is to simply focus our energy on God. Focus our energy on Christ. Stop for a second. Pray. See, through prayer, prayer is just is, is another form of worshiping God, isn't it? Isn't it? In my mind, it is. And the psalmist, and the, uh, the psalmist helps us understand this worship in this next portion of, of Scripture, how to overcome worry, how to overcome feeling so overwhelmed. Psalm 6, Oh God, listen to my cry, hear my prayer. Oh God, listen to my cry, hear my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I cry to you for help when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the towering rock of safety. For you are my safe refuge, a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. Let me live forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. Now, David is the one that, that is recognized as writing this, this psalm. And, and in my studies and looking at it and trying to, trying to you know, make sure, it was probably, and they're all kind of consistent on this, all the commentaries I, I read, which is several, um, it's probably composed at the time when Absalom, David's son, <laughs> was in rebellion and David was literally on the run from his home and from the country that he loved. Okay, So this was... This was was thought to be in regard to, to that. And even though, even though David was only on the other side of the Jordan River, okay, even though it, to him, to David, it felt like he was on, on the other side of the earth. He felt like, like he was way out there. And, and, and David, as, as, as the overwhelming floods of, of the troubles that, that seemed to be pouring out all around him, in this psalm, in his mind, he could see, he could see this, this, this rock that was towering above the troubled waters. And David's like, if only I could reach that rock, I will be safe. That's my safe place. And as he was, and he, as he was chased out of the land that he loved, it, it was thought, it was thought or it was known to be the land of the Lord where he was, where he was living. But see, the, the countries across the Jordan kind of were excluded from the land of Canaan, you know, the land flowing with milk and honey. So, so at, at that, he's thinking, you know what? I am so far from the presence of God because, you know, the presence of God isn't on this side of the river. It's on this side of the river, you know? That's what he's kind of thinking here. See, at that time, they, they didn't know that the world was round. They thought it was just this extended plane and that somewhere there's a boundary, somewhere there's a limit, somewhere there's a fence that, you know, we can't go any farther, right? That's what it was thought back then at that point because, of course, you know, 1692, Columbus came, and, well, we'll spare the history lesson, but we, we get it, and... Um, but being distressed, David, being so distressed, he cries out to God just in this great anguish. I mean, think of it. Listen to me, oh God. Listen to me, God. Listen, listen. Hear me, oh God. Hear what I'm saying. My heart, God, is so overwhelmed right now. God, I'm overwhelmed. See, David's circumstance was serious. It was serious. But even though his heart was overwhelmed, then he, he says, to the ends of the earth, he prayed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is bigger than me feeling overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is so much bigger than my worry. Lead me to the rock The rock 
is that safety in the middle of his trouble. That rock is the safety in the middle of our troubles, in the middle of our worry, in the middle of us feeling overwhelmed. The rock, that rock is Jesus, right? He, he allows us, we have to allow him to lead us. Jesus, the rock, has got to lead us. We, we've got to allow ourselves, especially when we're worried, especially when we're overwhelmed. We have to allow Jesus to lead us. Because if he's not leading us, let me ask you this. Who is? Who is? Let that sink in. See, David is encouraged. And David gives us encouragement when he says, you are my fortress. You are my fortress where my enemies can't not reach us. Where my enemies cannot reach me. And your enemy? Being overwhelmed. That's your enemy. Worry. That's your enemy. I know we've all been run down by life. We have. We've been exhausted. And like David, maybe it seems like, maybe it seems like you're, the whole world is against you. Maybe there are times when we, don't, when we don't think we can even make it through the day. Isn't there? See, quite often, David, he found himself in these situations where it did seem like the entire world was after him. The entire world was against him. I think, about, think about David's life at the point of this psalm. Right? Think about just David's life. He was taken from being just this simple shepherd just watching over his father's flocks, watching over the pastures, chasing away animals, to being assigned the task of being the bodyguard and a musician for the first king. Wow. You think about that. From a shepherd to that. How many times was he sent into battle? How many times did King Saul hunt him down? Then he became king. Now imagine your life. Okay, imagine your life. No matter what the circumstance in your life is, no matter how your situation may change, no matter the reason that you're going through what you're going, no matter where you are, even if it is at the end of your earth, We can relate to this psalm. We can relate to David, can't we? You know, it, it may seem like just in everyday life that, that the world is against you. I mean, you may have your own Absalom chasing you, whatever that may be. You know, maybe, it's, maybe it, you've gotten a bad diagnosis. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you lost your job. Maybe someone close to you, very close to you, has passed. Maybe, maybe you've got up, caught up in some temptation that you are just seriously convicted about. Whatever your situation. Let's look at David. See, David never lost sight of the one who could get him through. He never lost sight of that. Try turning to God. Try turning to God when your heart is so overwhelmed it doesn't feel like you can take one more step. Turn to God when all you really want to do is eat that bucket of ice cream if that's how you handle it. 
Turn to God if all you want to do is sleep. Turn to God in whatever it is that you, that you would normally turn to in that point. Maybe, <laughs> uh, I won't say it. But here's the thing with God. His word your prayer, is never going to return void. It's not. It's not a waste of time. It is not like me looking at these plans day after day knowing they're coming back. It's not a waste of time. And I know some, some say, oh, pastor, pastor, pastor. I just don't think I have the faith. I don't think, if I, ha- I, don't think I have the faith to get over what I have to get over. Pastor, I'm just lacking in faith. But you know what? God can take that small amount. God can take that small amount and work miracles with it. People, pour out. Pour out your overwhelming heart. Pour it out to God. Pour out your worries. Let go of feeling overwhelmed. See? We can give it to God. And guess what? God is never overwhelmed. He's never overwhelmed. Let's pray. Father, thank you. God, we just, we, we sit here as, as uh, uh, I would say it goes far beyond this community. It goes far beyond our nation. We just worry. God, we spend so much time being overwhelmed where we could be using our energies elsewhere. God, let's just focus on, on you. Give us, that, give us that prompting from, from the Holy Spirit, God, that it's time right now at this moment, as we're feeling overwhelmed, to reach out to you and to take that away. God, we have one option, and that's you. In my mind, there's one option, that's you. There's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that we can do to change the situation, but you can. God, how amazing it is that we can trust in you. God, we just thank you right now for being there for us, for being by our side, for sending us your son so so he could experience what we experience, so he can relate and say, you know what? Been there, done that. Thank you, Father. We just pray now for these um, 